Hello and welcome to Lore of the Cards, the series that looks to find the lore hidden in your Hearthstone deck. Today we have something special for you, something epic, something new, wonderful, mysterious, in fact, you could call it a secret. Right? How special is it? Well, just the story behind the card that's yet to see the light of day, that is, until now. But I'm not going to reveal it yet. Oh no, every lore fan knows that to appreciate the story behind the card, you need context and mystery. Of course, if you're not a lore fan, you can always hit this annotation, but before you go... Ah, uh, who am I kidding? They're already gone. The goblins of Azeroth are a fractured race. While they all share a love for chaotic inventions that explode and an insatiable lust for coin that doesn't, goblin society is broken up into competing cartels. These organisations are led by opposing trade princes, each controlling their own trade network, protective army and any other business ventures that may prove lucrative. To succeed in business, particularly with other goblins, one must be calculating and cutthroat. There has been more than one occasion when competition between cartels turned to bloodshed, conflicts taking place in the seedy underbelly of society, such as the trade wars upon the goblins' island home of Kazan before the orcs came to Azeroth. One only must look at the most well-known trade prince, Jastor Gallywix, to get an idea of how ruthless they are. At the age of 10, he took over his family business and his local crime syndicate, the Copper Street Gang, blowing up the previous leader, Skezo, in plain sight. Within a year, Gallywix was a millionaire. By the time of the Second War, he was the second richest goblin in the Bilgewater Cartel, and he became leader after buying the land out from underneath the previous trade prince, Maldi. I mean, even Gallywix's Hearthstone card couldn't let a game go by without asking, Where's my cat? Arguably the most powerful goblin cartel is the Steamweedle, the cartel Gaslow belongs to. During the Second War between the Orcish Horde and the Alliance of Lordaeron, the Steamweedle entered into a lucrative contract with the Horde, selling them the aid of explosive, um, well, not experts as such. Hello? Okay. Yes, boss. Yes. All right. Okay! Yes, boss! They also share goblin zeppelins and even enslaved giant sea turtles. You would have thought after the Horde lost the war, the Steamweedle would have been financially ruined. But remember the old saying, the only things that would survive the fallout of a mass mana bombing would be cockroaches and goblin enterprise. The Steamweedle managed to negotiate neutrality in the conflict between Alliance and Horde that is fought on and off to this day, now selling their services to the highest bidder. The capital of the Steamweedle is the town of Gadgetzan, a rare piece of civilization within the sunbaked Tanaris Desert. Not exactly the highest praise, considering cannibalistic sand fury trolls, marauding South Sea pirates, and skittering Silithid aren't as civilized. Despite Gadgetzan's relative isolation, it has played host to many adventurers over the years, seeking to earn some gold from the wealthy Steamweedle by dealing with any pirate threats, and making use of the services of some of the finest goblin engineers, merchants, and alchemists in all of Azeroth. One of the town's many attractions was the elixir created by Marin Nogginfogger. Bewildered and amused by the transforming Nogginfogger elixir, people travel from every corner of Azeroth to sample this bizarre tincture. The elixir gives one of three random effects turns the consumer into a skeleton, handily allowing them to breathe underwater, shrinks them, or grants them the ability to slow fall, allowing them to jump off mountains unharmed. This one-of-a-kind invention allowed Nogginfogger to acquire a huge amount of wealth, also gaining him status and respect among the Steamweedle cartel. Then, the cataclysm came. Deathwing, the corrupted black dragon aspect tool of the old gods, returned to Azeroth after recovering from injuries in the elemental plane of Deepholm. More powerful than he had ever been, Deathwing's re-entry shook the very foundations of the world. The earth was torn asunder, tornadoes raged, lava spewed from the ground, and monstrous floods choked the land. Gadgetzan became even more isolated. The Thousand Needles Canyon, one of the only routes to access the Tanaris Desert on foot, had become flooded. While this could have reduced the amount of people that could visit Gadgetzan and cut off a trade route for the Steamweedle, the canny goblins spun the global tragedy into a positive, in a way only goblins could. The sea, having encroached upon the land close to the town, had made Gadgetzan a beautiful seaside resort. Not to mention the convenient access to the sea, making it all the easier for the Steamweedle to trade with the rest of Azeroth. 
The shattering of Azeroth was not without minor complications for the Steamweedle. They now had their hands full trying to re-establish their trade routes and of course make as much profit from this disaster as they possibly could. As many of the key players within the cartel were busy with these tasks, the Steamweedle decided to hand control of Gadgetzan over to Nogginfogger, naming him Baron of Gadgetzan. After all, Marin's concoction had proved the Goblin was a shrewd businessman and helped put Gadgetzan on the map. Within the tavern, over a game of Hearthstone, regulars and travellers alike reminisce about their visits to Gadgetzan. Tales are told and fond memories shared about the town they have not been able to visit since the flooding of the Thousand Needles, too hard up for coin to travel to the town by air or sea. As the ale flows more freely, their tongues loosen and they get carried away by their imaginations, wondering what Gadgetzan may be like now. Some of these musings may be true, some wistful fantasies. But these tavern tales have convinced many that Gadgetzan, since the Cataclysm, is now a very different place. It is this fanciful version of Gadgetzan that is explored within the new expansion for Hearthstone, Mean Streets of Gadgetzan. It is said that with the Steamweed all busy, Nogginfogger saw this as the perfect opportunity to further increase his wealth and power. Making full use of the town's sea trade routes, Nogginfogger could transform the town of Gadgetzan into a bustling trade city. He relaxed trading laws, invested in risky engineering projects, and restructured the entire town, dwarfing the rest stop that Gadgetzan had once been. Finding out about what Nogginfogger had achieved without any permission given to him, the trade prince of the Steamweedle began to fear that the greedy tycoon may be making a bid for independence from the cartel. The Steamweedle turned their attention back to Gadgetzan, but too late. Nogginfogger had already experienced what he could achieve without the cartel, and no longer wanted to be subject to their whims. Not to mention the Nogginfogger cartel has a nice ring to it. Nogginfogger was no fool, however, and knew that even with the power he had gained, the Steamweedle would be able to crush any opposition he might pose. So the Goblin sought aid within Gadgetzan. With the city's meteoric rise, it had attracted many unsavoury characters and groups looking to make their fortune, and having influence on who would lead the port city was an opportunity three of these groups could not pass up. Nogginfogger was able to make an alliance with a group of thugs and ruffians the grimy goons, led by the two-headed ogre, Don Hancho. Within Gadgetzan, certain types of fighter gravitated towards each other, finding common ground, and the goons were made up of warriors, hunters, and paladins. This group provided Nogginfogger with the muscle and intimidation he needed. A constant presence on Gadgetzan streets enabled to make accidents occur when they needed to. The group's founder, Don Hancho, is an anomaly. Many two-headed ogres have an aptitude for casting ferocious spells, but despite his intelligence, neither of his heads, Han, the smart one, or Cho, the less smart one, can bend magic to their will. What the ogre does have, though, is one head with a shrewd mind for business. Don Hancho may never possess the power of magic, but his brain and brawn gifted him arguably a greater power, the power of influence and cunning. He achieved his position through blackmail, extortion, and the intimidating grimy goons under his command, bringing the ogre mountains of money. With huge investment and several explosion-related delays, Don Hancho was able to open the first bank of Gadgetzan with approval from Nogginfogger himself. When Gadgetzan was a small town, its bank was victim to numerous Kodo-loving bank robbers, using their stampeding beasts to smash down the walls of any safe that dared try to keep them out. Hancho's safes are unbreakable, the two cavernous vaults protected with doors that can withstand Kodo pressures exceeding several hundred tons. If anyone dares to try and tinker with the locks of the doors, they soon find themselves engulfed in an explosion. As operator of the first bank, Hancho has been able to rake in a cut from stolen goods fenced at the Gadgetzan Emporium and established dominant control of the Grime Street neighbourhood. Nogginfogger knew that Brawn was not the only weapon needed to defeat an organisation as powerful as the Steamweedle Cartel. Magic and alchemy were weapons that could be used just as effectively, and for this he recruited a ragtag group of priests, mages and warlocks called the Cabal. 
led by the troll Kazakus. The troll's past is shrouded in mystery, and rumours are abound as to what his origins may be. Relatively speaking, the troll race is new to magic. Their inability to cast it saw them unable to stand up to the Night Elves around 15,000 years ago, and even as recently as the Troll Wars 2,800 years ago, which saw their armies fall to the strength of human and high elven mages, as the trolls made a bid for power to restore their grand empire they once had. Given this history, Kazakus's knowledge of the arcane is far deeper than it has any right to be, leading to rumours that he may be a demon, dragon, or some other powerful entity in disguise. These rumours have gained even more support with the presence of Rathian within Gadgetzan, one of the final two surviving black dragons. Given his knowledge of spellwork, Kazakus may be from the Blue Flight, and Rathian may be in the city to reignite the great friendship their flights once shared, much like the camaraderie Naltharian and Malagos shared until Naltharian became Deathwing 10,000 years ago, and the maddened aspect butchered nearly all of Malagos' flight, beginning the Blue Leviathan's descent into madness. Or is there a third black dragon, still affected by his father's insanity, that Rathian must put an end to? Kazakus has accumulated his fanatical power crazed followers by offering them the red mana that only he can supply. The spellcasters willingly ignore that the mana makes them susceptible to mood swings, paranoia, and erodes their will to deny any order that Kazakus gives them. The power surge this rare magical material gives them far outweighs any of these minor side effects. The Cabal established their criminal empire within Gadgetzan through the creation and sale of illegal potions. The Gadgetzan mega market upon the docks allows the Cabal to slip through the crowd, selling their wares, smuggling in more of their illegal concoctions, and any other unsavoury items that may pique Kazakus's interest. No doubt there is no effort to stop these spellweavers as part of the agreement with Noggenfogger for the Cabal's aid against the Steamweedle. Many conspiracy theories have circulated about the Cabal, and Noggenfogger makes sure to dismiss all of them. There was one final group Noggenfogger approached to aid him in his defence against the Steamweedle. The Goblin had muscle and magic, but sometimes in war, you need subtlety, a deft hand or blade to silence your opponents and put the advantage into your court. This service was provided by a collection of rogues, druids and shaman called the Jade Lotus, led from the shadows by Aya Blackpaw. Many don't know that Aya is the true leader of the Lotus. Fearful whispers fill many of the back alleys of Gadgetzan about the presumed leader. White Eyes. This merciless Pandaran warrior towers over all that stand before him. White Eyes has become feared all over Gadgetzan, his name often invoked by thugs to instill fear in each other. Hey, watch your back, or White Eyes will jump out the shadows and get you. Particularly chilling when considering this is exactly what White Eyes would do. While the intimidating White Eyes acts as the Lotus's figurehead, he unquestioningly follows the orders of young Aya Blackpaw, the last living heir of the Blackpaw family. From her base within the Gadgetzan Museum of Ancient Artifacts, Aya has eyes and ears all over Gadgetzan. Aya's public persona is that of a generous philanthropist, supporting the museum and bringing culture and sophistication to Gadgetzan, concealing her true identity as as one of the most powerful criminal masterminds within the city. Bizarrely, unlike Don Hancho and Kazakus, Aya's criminal activities are not in the pursuit of wealth. She is obsessed with a special kind of jade and will obtain it by any means necessary, usually via theft, but even if it means paying good money for it. She is known to generously reward her most effective subordinates with jade trinkets of their own. Blackpaw's museum recently has been offering free artifact appraisals, ably assisted by the black market auctioneer Madame Goya, for their Mysteries of Pandaria exhibition. For any citizen of Gadgetzan presenting jade for the exhibition, Goya has promised to credit the finder with a nifty plaque. What Aya looks to achieve by amassing this jade is still unknown, but the odd whisper has escaped her inner circle. The rumour is that the jade she is stashing has a nefarious purpose, and that Blackpaw is in contact with the spirit of an ancient Mogu king. With these dangerous but useful allies on his side, Noggenfogger was ready to oppose the Steamweedle in the type of war goblins knew how to fight best. Victories were not won on battlefields, but through market manipulation, dodgy deals, and entrepreneurship. 
with the odd fight taking place within the darkest recesses of the city. At the end of this secretive war, Gadgetzan had grown into a metropolis and all three groups that sided with Nogginfogger were filthy rich. Nogginfogger had made Gadgetzan a small corner of the world where business could be done his way, and as a result, his personal assets skyrocketed like never before. Nogginfogger quickly held a thoroughly rigged election, which named him Mayor of Gadgetzan, legitimising his power within the city. With Nogginfogger in charge, the profits and trade experienced in Gadgetzan were astronomical. But with the Steamweedle influence greatly reduced, new problems arose, and it is around this time of unrest that the mean streets of Gadgetzan expansion takes place. All Nogginfogger's partners hated each other, and each group now had ambitions to become far more than just lackeys to some jumped up goblin merchant. They each wanted control of Gadgetzan, with what it had become it was a prize well worth winning, and one that the grimy goons, Cabal and Jade Lotus were willing to fight each other for. Gadgetzan's trade position within the world remained strong, but crime within the city increased exponentially as the crime lords vied for supremacy. Nogginfogger couldn't conduct even one interview without some smart mouth reporter pointing this out, the goblin taking great pleasure in having their presence removed from his. Don Hancho and his goons have been amassing weaponry, Kazakus and the Cabal are willing to achieve power through any means necessary, and Aya Blackpaw may have an ancient, powerful Mogu king ready to serve her. It's not long before the tensions between these three groups see all-out war spill out onto the grimy streets of Gadgetzan. Nogginfogger may have lost control of his pets, but the cunning goblin has been able to play his problems off each other before and this betrayal may have been a part of the goblin's plan all along. With all this crime about Gadgetzan and a thoroughly corrupt mayor, where's the strong arm of the law, you ask? Well, you've waited patiently, unless you use that annotation. And at this point, you hang your head in shame as some bloke with an annoying or buttery voice, it's been called both, tells you off from the other side of the world. You're a bad, bad man or woman. Now that that's done, it's time for the card reveal. The diminutive and fiery law enforcer, Sergeant Sally. Sally is what one would call unconventional, a loose cannon that has given every guard captain she served under such bouts of severe chronic heartburn, it even makes the Fire Lord cringe. Unfortunately for law enforcement bureaucrats everywhere, the knee-high bundle of righteous fury that is Sally doesn't even give a second thought to political woes. All that matters to her is justice and results achieving these by any means necessary. So what if she borrowed heaps of illegal weapons and magic from the evidence locker to get the job done? So what if she caused more damage than the criminal she was chasing? So what if she breaks a few eggs to make some omelettes? She gets the job done, doesn't she? This reckless attitude has seen Sally plastered with commendations throughout her career, congratulating her for the crook she has caught. But among these commendations are almost countless charges of misconduct. Sally is clearly crazy, and will often throw herself into what seem unwinnable situations, but this is when she's at her best, relishing any challenge that comes her way. As her Hearthstone card aptly displays, she'd rather be blown up with a power overwhelming than let any of the enemy minions live. Perhaps the strangest thing about Sally, stranger than her burning blue eyes and apparent love for sirens, is that no one really knows where she came from. She just showed up and started dispensing justice. She's not even on the city payroll. She's like a small angry Batman, dishing out her own brand of justice to any criminal unfortunate to be caught in her gaze. While the lawless scum of Gadgetzan mean that Sally's job is never ending, there's no other place she'd rather be, exhilarated by the challenge of cleaning up the streets. All criminals fear her and are quick to run if they catch a glimpse of her shocking pink pigtails or the light emanating from her sirens. I'd tell Sergeant Sally that the sirens on her shoulders were a bad idea, but best not. Sally will be an ideal choice for those needing effective board clears and for those that want to bring a heavy dose of justice to the game board. Either way, you'll get results. The grimy goons are particularly good at working Sally up before she even goes out on patrol, but she'll get them one day. So there you have it, a new legendary card revealed. I hope you enjoyed, and thanks so much to Blizzard for allowing me to share this card and my love of lore with you all. Remember, this could all be true, 
or maybe just tavern tales, drunkenly yelled by an inebriated dwarf. Either way, I hope you enjoy Mean Streets of Gadget Sam. Six gamers cover Hearthstone lore in general, so if you want to find out more, check out our Lore of the Cards playlist. Better yet, like, share, subscribe, and if you want to keep as up to date as possible on what the channel's doing, follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Until next time guys, stay on the right side of the lore, or Sally's gonna get ya. And happy hearthstoning.